Amen. So excited for looking at God's word from Luke today. Luke chapter 1, the story of Zacharias, who was the father of John the Baptist. To summarize for a few verses, he was of the priest lineage, and he had a season where he would minister in the, in the house of the Lord. In those days, they would take turns and they would divide up the responsibilities. And there was a need in Zacharias' home. They were without child. In verse 11, Zacharias was doing his things, offering the sacrifice, the, he was at the right of the altar of incense. And that's a connection, that word incense has a, has a connection with prayers. Throughout the scriptures, you will find that when the people prayed, it was a sweet-smelling savor. It was, when, we pray, when we pray, God is receiving that. He's hearing your prayers. In verse 13, the angel said to him, it was an angel that just shows up. Back up in verse 12. If you saw an angel where you were working, if an angel suddenly appeared in your home, what would you, whoa. You would be stunned, shocked, maybe a little afraid. And that was the situation with Zacharias. The angel says, don't be afraid. Isn't it interesting how many times God says to his people, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Many things that can cause us to fear in these days that we live in. But Jesus often says to us, don't be afraid. The angel says, to him, your petition has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit. While yet in his mother's womb, he will turn back many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. That is God's heartbeat. That is God's desire today to turn many people back to him. God loves the backsliders. God loves those who follow him at a distance. God does not give up very easily. And it will be he, verse 17, it will be he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God is desiring to prepare the church for the coming of the Lord. Isn't that exciting? God is preparing the church for his return. Throughout Scripture, you'll find that Jesus spoke in parables. One of those parables was the ten virgins, five foolish, five wise. Remember that story? The five wise, they took extra oil with them. The five foolish just kind of winged it, kind of hoped for the best, ran out of oil, began to get panicked, began to get concerned they were going to miss the bridegroom, so they asked the five Wise, can we have some of your oil? And they said, no, we only have enough for ourselves. See, everyone has to draw your own oil. 
Everyone has to get enough oil, and that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. He has enough for He has enough oil for every one of us here today. He has enough oil for you and I today by the Holy Spirit. He has enough oil by his grace every day to live and to have our being. He is a supplier of our oil. Back to Zacharias, there was a little doubt that came along here. I want to just make note of this. Zacharias, verse 18, said to the angel, how shall I know this for certain? Uh Uh-oh. It was like, uh uh-oh. Shouldn't have said that. It was just, now, I wasn't a, you know, you might think, well, that wasn't a big deal. What, what's the problem? Well, the scripture begins to unfold here. See, Zacharias began to think in his own humanity. God just told him he was going to have a child. It's going to be a miracle because you're old. Your wife is advanced in age, beyond childbearing. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be a miracle. Isn't it interesting how God shows up? When we think it's no use, when it's, we've reached our end, we, we, we become just, there's no hope, there's no use. We give up on people, we give up on life sometimes. We come to the end of ourselves. But the angel says, I am Gabriel, verse 19, who stands in the presence of God. He was right out of the presence of God. Only two angels that we know are mentioned, that that I I think that are mentioned, two are angels, Gabriel and Michael. Michael is a warring angel. Gabriel was an announcing angel. Then there are a lot of angels that God uses in his kingdom, and he uses angels to guard us. Find it in Scripture. The angel says, I have been sent to you to speak. I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Verse 20, and behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe my words, which shall be fulfilled in their proper time. Now, that's, that's the, that was the problem. The angel pointed out what was the problem. It wasn't necessary that he questioned, had questioned, but his question dealt with unbelief. Oh, my goodness. We are, are we all sometimes struggle with doubt? I'll be honest. I... I will be honest, my own self struggles with doubt from time to time. We all struggle with doubt from time to time because we're constantly in this battle of keeping strong in the Lord. We know, we know God could do anything. We, we know that. How many know that? You know that? Yes. But the question, will you? Right? Will you? But the angel said, you're, you're going to have a, you're going to have a child. Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, comes to Zacharias, who's on the earth, who's doing the ministerial duty of his time. Zacharias, you ought to know better because you have been a minister. But even ministers struggle. Every person struggles. And the the quicker we admit that, the better we're off. The problem sometimes with, so, so we kind of sometimes have a problem separating ministry, ministers, and ministers have a responsibility. Of course they do. They have a calling. But all of us are called to minister to the Lord. We're all ministers. You minister to the Lord when you wait on, when you call upon, when you praise him, when you seek him. 
when you help other people that are in the community or in your home, you're ministering to the Lord as much as you've done unto the least of them. He says, you've done it unto me. So Zacharias is, he's muted. God put a zipper on his mouth. Remember in the old classroom in kindergarten or first grade, the teacher would say, zip. Remember that? That meant to be quiet. Isn't it interesting? I find it interesting. Now, Zacharias dared to question. He was trying to figure it out in human, human terms, humanity. How could this be? This is impossible. So how do you and I deal with, human, uh, with doubt? How do you and I deal with this humanity? By the way, Christmas week, our minds are more on the Lord and his coming to the earth. God comes down, becomes humanity. That's an unbelievable thought in itself, that he would leave heaven and come down to the earth and allow himself to become a small infant to be nurtured and cared for, and he was dependent upon his mother and father. Unbelievable. Why did he do that? Because it was the only way that you and I would be able to be forgiven and our sins would be removed as far as the east is from the west. When whosoever believeth on him should not perish. 1 Corinthians 2.14 declares this, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. The, what is, a natural man is one who has not been converted yet. One who is, does not have the Spirit of God living in us. And we're thinking in the natural. We're living in the natural. We're only thinking in what is science would only prove. We're only thinking about well, that's impossible. The things of the Spirit are not understood. The things of God don't make sense. The natural man has a had hard time. Why should I go to church? Why should I pray? Why should I give money to people I don't know? A missionary, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Why should I do anything for someone else? They haven't done anything for me. We, we get into this natural state. But the other part of the verse is for the, it, it reads this. He cannot understand because they are spiritually understood or appraised. Another verse, version, I think, used discerned. A natural man. Let me, let me encourage you. When the Spirit of God comes in your heart, you're not natural anymore. You're, you become spirit-filled you're spirit-filled. You're spirit, the spirit of God living in you. You are not. You're, you're not going to just rely on your natural instincts anymore. You got the help of the Holy Spirit with you. So when you go to those places that are, are are hard questions in life, and you have the Spirit of God, you have the Word of God that brings to you understanding. You have the help of the Holy Spirit that helps bring the understanding. Remember the words of Jesus when he, we just spoke about a little bit about John 14 last week about the hearts, let not your heart be troubled. He was talking about leaving. The disciples were upset. Why are you leaving us now right in the prime of, of the, your ministry? And we had all these, you know, you know they were, their heads were hanging low. They were, they, were, they were down. And Jesus said, wait a minute, well, you guys, let not your heart be troubled. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send the helper. I'm going to not leave you as orphans. I'm going to send the helper. And it is the help of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26 declares the helper, the Holy Spirit, when the Father, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Oh, isn't that wonderful? 
bring to you remembrance all that I've said to you. So the disciples, when they got into the, you know, in the book of the book of Acts, when their ministry started to take off and God filled them, filled them with the Holy Spirit, they were to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in the upper room in the book of Acts. Then they went out preaching the word of God and signs and wonders begin to follow. Extraordinary miracles begin to take place. People were raised up who were lame. For example, in, in Acts chapter 3, the lame man who had been sitting begging for probably most of his life depended upon someone to give him a coin, something to eat. And just so happened Peter was on the on his routine way to prayer, and it's for some reason that day. But if, if your mind starts to think, what about the other days? He probably, maybe he passed him by another day, but this was the day the Lord was, had intention to do something great. And this, this poor man is saying, what do you have? What do you have? He, Peter, I don't have anything. I don't have silver or gold. I don't have anything that's going to help you. But what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ Rise up and walk. See, God is interested in transforming people's lives. God is interested in not just giving people a lunch. He does that. He provides for us. But he's more interested in your spiritual health because your eternal life that is so precious that he desires for you and I to live forever. So this man was healed. It was an extraordinary miracle. There were other things that happened throughout the book of Acts. There were people that were, were healed and just by the, being in the presence of the apostles. There were just extraordinary things that happened. But why was God doing such things? Because sometimes people don't believe unless they see something real, physical. I want you to begin to think and dream with me this year coming up. Let's begin to pray for miracles to happen. Why don't we believe God for healing? Why don't we believe God for changing people's lives? Let's believe God. Let's press in. God is God. God is God. God can do anything. But he, take, he, he looks for people who are willing to pray, who stands in the gap. What people are in need of today is the person of Jesus Christ comes to live within us. That's the greatest need of our world right now. Greatest need is people to believe. And whosoever believes on him shall not perish. Over and over again, Jesus asked a question throughout his ministry. Who do you say that I am? Who do people say that? You know, he was trying to get the disciples to figure out. Finally, one day, Peter, by the by the help of God, says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, it was, he nailed it. Because Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the one from God. He is God. See, there's this little word we know is faith. Faith requires us to step out even though we don't know for sure about things. Amen? Faith is the substance of things not seen. We, 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 don't, we don't know exactly, we don't know exactly what our life will be like in a, a month, two months, a year. We don't, but we know who Jesus is and who he said he is and what he said he's going to do for us. He's going to keep Staying with us by the help of the Holy Spirit. What, peop what is it that keeps people from believing? Let's just think about what, what are the, some of the excuses that you hear? Well, here, I've heard this a lot. If there's really a God, why is there so much problem in the world? You've heard that one? Yeah. Why is there so much chaos? Why is there so much pain? Why is there so much abuse? We, we hear, why is, why is this? How do we answer that? My answer to that would be because sin entered into the picture, because man disobeyed. Man chose 
to do what God said not to do. And therefore, we are in the mess we are in. But God sent his son to redeem us and restore us. See, we're going to see at the end of this story today what God did for Zacharias. He didn't leave him muted. He just turned off his, his tongue for a while. That'd be kind of a bummer, wouldn't it? Especially with those who love the visit. But you guys today, you got this text thing. Yeah? Zacharias didn't have a text machine. He, had, he wrote it down on paper. And when he got to the end of, you know, when, when Elizabeth gave birth, there was, there was this confusion over what we're going to name. We're going to name him Zacharias, aren't we? No, 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 no. It's going to be John. They were astounded. There was nobody in their family named John. But they had heard from God. How do we overcome doubt? I believe this in Revelation 12, 11, it says they overcame him. They overcame the devil. They overcame doubt because of the blood of the lamb. Because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even to death. How can so many people in the earth be able to stand against martyrism? What is it about people who, who have, are willing to give their lives? Where does that come from? What kind of faith is that? This is an undying faith. It's a faith to be admired. It's a faith that would encourage you and I. It's a faith that if my brother and my sister in their places and their humility can love God and be happy with barely anything in comparison to what we have, then there's something about this God. There's something that's real. There's something that's more than what we see on the surface, that there's something deeper that he will carry you through in, in your hardest times, in your hardest moments. The church is not exempt from going to trial, not exempt from being in the fire. We sang about or another in the fire. There's, he's there with us. Zacharias, Robbie had a lot of soul searching to do while he was muted. Probably needed something was going on within him. You see, God in the scriptures in Hebrews says that he, he disciplines those whom he loves. In other words, God doesn't just let us go on our own way. He wants us to become more what he desires. He wants you to come to that next place, that level of that intimacy with him and that transformation begins to take place. I remember growing up in the church, being in church Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesdays was youth, and sometimes then we would go visit whatever. It was, it was a lot of things that was encouraging to me. There were, were, were several men in the church that spoke life into my heart, encouraged me by their example. See, there are churches where you, you've got to realize there are people who have prayed for the young people, have prayed for you and I, and now we are becoming perhaps the people that ought to be doing the praying. But I believe that prayers that have been prayed even years ago are still continuing to be carried out because God is faithful. You see, the, here's, the, here's the whole deal. Even though we don't get to see the answer or we don't get to see the miracle, we still can believe God heard us, God is going to work in his own timing, and God will carry it and bring it to pass. And may the doubters, may all the doubters, we used to sing this chorus, let God arise 
His enemies be scattered. Remember that one? Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let God, let God arise. Then we sing it. Let God arise. Let doubts be scattered. Right? Remember that? Doubts. That little word, that little thought. But oh, it will he. How can this be? My wife's beyond. This sounds very similar to Abraham and Sarai. Sarai really had a problem with it. She laughed out loud when she overheard them talking. The natural man. See, what you, you can't tell a person that's filled with the Holy Spirit that can't be done. And they, it will, it won't, that won't stop them. The people who are led by the Spirit, I believe sometimes people have the gift of faith. The gift of faith is over and beyond average faith. That's one of the nine gifts. And miracles. Some have the gift of healing. But where is our expectancy? What are we expecting God to do? That's oftentimes we only get what we expect. And sometimes we can shoot ourselves in the foot before we, you know, do it ourselves down before we try to get anywhere. I just, I got, um, it was so kind of intriguing to me, Vern, when you mentioned of something about your Scandinavian background when it came to um, conflict. You mentioned that in your study. Boy, I could relate to that. Just don't want to ruffle the waters. You don't like to deal with people's. Want everybody to be happy and get along. Why can't we all just get along? And so, but that's not always the case. And it's, I'm learning it's not always a bad thing that we have conflict. It's how we deal with the conflict. In fact, the matter is we will have conflict. In your family and in your career, there will be days when you will be challenged. And we need to say, you know, we need to look, look inward. Am I willing to change? Am I willing to surrender? Am I willing to forgive? Am I willing to hear? Am I willing to believe in people? There's a lot of doubters in the world, and there's even some doubters in the church. Well, let it never quench. Let it, may it never be something that we give up because I have to chuckle. It was an instructor in my North Central days. He would say something like this, don't worry about and when he talked about revival in the church. Now, this was this is something, this is in the, in, in the inner circle. He would say something like this. When revival hits, don't worry about it. There's always enough wet blankets to put it out. And he, we would laugh about it. What he meant was, there's always a few that are skeptical. And it's, you know, it's humanity. And sometimes we just have to check ourselves. Am I, am I in that place where I need to be? Am I in that place where I'm seeking for the, for the presence of God to, to do a miracle? Am I believing for people's health and minds to be restored? And people that are hurting in, the, in their homes and people that are lonely. 
And always when God disciplines, there's a day of, of joy that will come later because he disciplines us for our own good, he says. And though it may bring pain, it may bring... Why can't it just be easy? Be encouraged. Here's the deal. God knew that Zacharias would doubt. Isn't it great to know God doesn't wait for us to be perfect to use us? We'd be dead in the water, wouldn't we? He says, come as you are. Even with your doubts, walk with me. Together. And I will lead you where you may not understand all the stuff that's going on in any days. Many days you will have questions. But trust me, I will lead you out and I will bring you back. I will bring you to the places where you need to go to experience more of me. So what the Lord knows and understands, he knows what it takes to bring us to that place where we will grow in him, we will be stretched, our faith will be embedded even more. I'm so glad. God is in work. He's in, at work in us. Philippians 2, 14. For God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is pleased with you and I when we look to him. When we say, have your way, he's pleased. God is pleased with us when we admit our, our unbelief. Remember that story in the New Testament where the the boy, or there's a boy that was under the demonic influence. He was, you know, beat up by demonic. He was hurled. He was. D there was a man who cried out in Mark 9, 23 and 24, says this. Jesus said to him, if you can, what the man was saying, the father said, if you can, Lord, can you heal him? If you can, but Jesus said, if you can. All things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and began saying, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Perfect. He admits, I do believe, but I also help me in my unbelief. Help me with my struggle to believe. Help me with my struggle to believe that God hears my prayer, that God even pays attention to what I am going through. Help my unbelief. When you say, Pastor, I prayed it many times. It doesn't seem to change. Yeah. I understand that. But I've learned few things. I've learned a few things. And I've come to realize it may be that God is dealing with you and I through the prayer process. If he just gave it to you, boom, and it was there, oh, we'd go, wow. But will we keep seeking him even? Will we keep seeking him if we are not in such a need. Yeah? Where does God want us to be? He wants us to be seeking him. Totally depending. There'll be days over and over, battle one, battle out to the other, and you're overwhelmed. And he just wants you to take this, take him and just look to him. Bring it all to him. Bring it all. A, a basket or a truckload or semi load of, just dump it at his feet. There are things that you and I cannot carry on our own. We shouldn't even. I've had moments where I felt 
all alone. Even Elijah struggled, a man of God, used mightily, felt all alone for a moment in his life, abandoned. Jesus spoke to him, God spoke to him in the gentle, still breeze. It wasn't in the loud earthquake. It wasn't in the loud, you know, the noise. Here's the deal. The Lord understands our humanity. He, he became like one of us. He stepped into your world. Missionaries understand this whole idea. They're learning the language so that they can speak the language of the people's tribe where they're going. They learn to their culture. They learn what they eat. They learn voices, tones. Jesus was the greatest missionary. He came down and learned. He, he knew it already, but he, he put himself in a position. May this story of Zacharias See, it turns out after God opened his mouth, the Spirit of God came on Zacharias. He prophesied. He prophesied. You can read it toward the end of the chapter 1. He prophesies. He proclaims the things of God. He pronounces. And see, there was a new birth in his home, but there was a new birth in Zacharias' heart and spirit. There was a new, new life, a new strand a new thing, a new understanding. And God is not done with us until it's done, until we're with him. He was not. He's not going to stop working in us. And so we work through this. We're going to go back, sing. Annalitas, please, thank you so much, doing such a great job of bringing us into the presence of the Lord. Let's just take some more moments. Focus on our Lord again. <laughs>